This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the friends of KUHF Houston. Today, low-cost housing proves to be much more than we first thought. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. We've all seen those elementary houses in poor neighborhoods. They consist of three or four rooms in a row with a forward slanting roof over a front porch. John Michael Vlach finds that those old houses tell a very interesting story. We call them shotgun houses. In the early 1930s, we decided they must be a regional invention from the Louisiana Bayou country. That's where the older ones seem to be concentrated. But Vlach looks more closely at old records. He traces the shotgun house to the early 1800s. Then he finds older shotgun houses in the sugar-growing plantation islands in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Finally, he finds that same distinctive design in Africa. If those were the houses of the poor, they were the houses of people forced to be poor. They're an adaptation of homes the slaves had left behind them. They're an African technology carried into the new world, but they came here by an indirect route. You see, the American slave trade was far too brutal. We systematically severed slaves from their cultural origins. The shotgun house had to find its way here through the Caribbean. In 1810, the population of New Orleans was just over 12,000. One-third was white, one-third was slave, the last third was a population of free blacks, most of whom had come here from Haiti. They brought the shotgun house design with them, and what they made of it was not ghetto housing by any means. The shotgun house builders in Haiti had written African motifs into their exterior timber framing. Now shotgun houses in New Orleans sprouted American gingerbread trimming. By the mid-19th century, many were positively Victorian in appearance. When the cost of wood fell during the late 1800s, the shotgun house did indeed become the best way the poor could keep a roof over their heads. But by then, shotgun houses had added a new element to the American architectural vocabulary. You see, shotgun houses gave us the southern porch. We didn't previously have porches like that in America. Like the shotgun house itself, southern porches are now all over America. So. The next time you see those rows of small linear houses in poor neighborhoods, consider what you're really seeing. Those are the remains of an African technology that reached considerable elegance among people of middle means in the 19th century. And it is a technology that left an indelible and formative mark on our landscape. It propagated that outward-looking sign of community all over America, the front porch from which we've greeted friends and neighbors ever since. Today, old gravestones. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. It is a fine sunny autumn day in Bridgehampton, New York. We are far out on southern Long Island, surrounded by upscale homes, but this town is pretty low-key. We find a nice lunch at an old-style diner called the Candy Kitchen. Then we stroll along Main Street, digesting both the lunch and the town. A big old Presbyterian church sits next to a much older graveyard. So, camera in hand, I walk the rows, photographing stones as I wonder who these people were. Daniel Moore, born a scant 87 years after the Pilgrims landed, departed this life in 1791. Who was Sophia Rysom, born during the American Revolution and died two years before the Civil War? Or Rebecca Topping, who was 12 when the Declaration of Independence was signed in distant Philadelphia? Deacon Maltby Gelston died 19 days after the British signed the Treaty of Paris, which acknowledged at last that America was a sovereign nation. No mention of that here. Instead, we find Gelston's will, where he still identifies himself as a colony of New York yeomen, and a conventional verse on his stone warns us away from complacency. Gelston's no more, his soul has winged its way from sin and darkness to celestial day. Weep, reader, weep, but not for him thus sigh. Weep for thyself, for you, like him, must die. 
I find one stone especially interesting, James Brown, who died in 1788. The Presbytery of Suffolk County was organized over at nearby Southampton in 1747. A year later, 28-year-old Brown took the pulpit here and served throughout our country's emergence. Suffolk County was generally pro-revolution, but the large and important Battle of Long Island took place far to the west, in Brooklyn, across the East River from Manhattan. One key player in that Southampton meeting was Nathaniel Mather of the famous Mather family. A century before, Increase Mather was a Puritan who'd counseled moderation during the Salem witch trials. It is better, he said, that ten suspected witches should escape than that one innocent person should be condemned. You and I shrink from the context of that remark, but we do well to heed it today, nevertheless. Increase Mather's son, Cotton Mather, lived a questioning life. For example, he got the idea of smallpox vaccination from his African servant and used it in the colonies, and kinsman Nathaniel Mather became a Presbyterian. So James Brown, buried here, represents the settled fruit of the Mather intellectual struggle. History swirls through this once remote farming community. We catch a glint of people struggling to determine who we should be in a new nation. I think they got it right. Maybe the fine houses obscure all that. Maybe not. In any case, my wife and I turn off to walk a while on the wide, empty beach before we have to plunge back into our own hectic lives in a different millennium, one so distant from the world we glimpsed briefly in that old graveyard. By the time this program reruns, it may well be ready for updating. That's because recent studies have been causing an old question to shift under our feet. Where did we modern humans, we Homo sapiens or Cro-Magnons, come from and when? For over a century, we'd thought that our technological species had arisen in Europe and the Near East some 40,000 years ago, and then rather quickly displaced the Neanderthals. It's clear that we began creating sophisticated cave painting and tool making, and that we have ever since been the only human species. But the search for our mutual origins has recently shifted away from Europe to artifacts and remains in Africa. Now, in South Africa, we're finding 70,000-year-old delicate bone awls and a 77,000-year-old piece of ochre engraved with a design. Most amazing are 90,000-year-old items from the Congo. An early harpoon for spearing fish has swept-backed hooks along its shank. Several flat beads look like small metal washers. And so the great explosion of art and technology clearly began not in Europe but in Africa. DNA evidence points back to the remains of a modern human African female whom we name Eve. She's about twice as old as the oldest of these fine artifacts. The current mystery is no longer where these people and their art came from, but how they made their way out of Africa. And here, two competing routes have been on the table. Both begin with modern humans who had moved north into Ethiopia. From there, the favored route was up through Suez and into the Holy Land. But DNA evidence supports the second route. It suggests that modern humans crossed the southern tip of the Red Sea, where Ethiopia almost touches Yemen today, and they continued through Arabia and Persia into India. Then they migrated both eastward and back to the northwest and Europe. They reached Australia some 60,000 years ago, maybe before they got to Europe. New York Times science writer John Noble Wilford points to two factors that archaeologists think caused the sudden technological explosion that these people created. One was population, the other adaptation. Population growth drove migration, and it drove people to go after harder-to-catch game. When there are enough of us to eat up all the slow-moving turtles, we must either move or invent new means for hunting more elusive animals. Those same factors work in yet another way. As populations increased, we sought out means for expressing our individual selves to one another. I am me. Here is a picture of what I am thinking. Here is my new invention. That's very important. It's the reason that art has always preceded utility in invention. So we came out of Africa. Eve really did move off to the east of her Eden. We carried our art, our inventions with us, and for better and for worse, we took over the world. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work.